Okay, so our mathematician's folly today is a really cool story. Uh, this guy, Yi Tang Zhang, who goes by Tom. Uh, he's currently a professor at UC Santa Barbara, but it was not an, an easy road. So uh, he goes by Tom. So Tom was born in, in China and he had a hard childhood. Um, he was poor and in a rural area and couldn't go to school, but eventually he got to go to school and eventually he got to go to university. So he we went to university. Then he came over here to the United States and got his PhD. It took a while. It wasn't easy, but he got a PhD. Then after he got his PhD, he applied for jobs like you do, and he didn't get any math jobs. This is something that happens to some people. You just don't get a job. So because he didn't get a math job, he worked at Subway making sandwiches. He worked at motels. He worked at other restaurants. He just did other things. And after a couple of years, his friend, so his friend had gotten a job at UNH, University of New Hampshire. Um, and I like this part of the story because I come from basically University of New Hampshire. I came from the town right next to it. My mom worked there. Um, so he was working at University, of, he got him a job as a lecturer. So we talked about the hierarchy of academia. If you're tenure track, you come in as an assistant professor, you get promoted to associate with tenure, and then you maybe get full professor eventually. Below that, there's visiting professor, which is what I am. Um, and then below that, there's like lecturer. So he, he, they were hired him to teach calculus. He maybe taught like four sections of calculus per semester, and he just got money for that. And he had an apartment uh, nearby. Um, and that's what he did. And after 15 years of that, he posted this paper on the internet where he proved this enormous result, like a big result that people had wanted to know for a long time. So it was very surprising because it was this guy who like didn't even have a research job. He didn't have any research funding at all. He was just sitting there like working on his problem for 15 years and he solved it. It was kind of an amazing story. Um, and after that, so his wife had been living, she was like, you can do whatever you want in New Hampshire. It's cold there. I'm not into it. So she lived in Santa Barbara and she had like a hairdressing shop there. Um, and so after, so after this like lecture, who didn't even have much of a job, um, uh, proved this big theorem, University of New Hampshire immediately took him from lecturer and made him a full professor. And then he got like, uh, uh, he got uh, uh, lots of invitations to give lectures and offers. And UC Santa Barbara, knowing that his wife was nearby, was like offered him a job as a professor. So that's where he is now. It's a happy ending for the story. He became a full professor. He's reunited with his wife. I wanted to tell you about the twin prime conjecture, the thing that he proved a big step on the way to, because um, it's a big open problem. So an open problem is like something that people want to know, but nobody has been able to prove it. So the twin prime conjecture says that there's infinitely pairs of prime numbers, P and Q, that are just two apart. So can you think of any two primes that are two apart? What? Three and five. Yeah, any more? Five and seven. What? 11 and 13, yeah, okay. And if we stayed here doing this for a long time, the conjecture is that we would never stop. Like we wouldn't ever have to go get lunch, we would never stop. The, the, the sets of twin primes never run out, they go forever. That's the conjecture. No matter how far out you go in the numbers, you can still find more. So computers have verified this for as far as computers are able to verify. You know, you let your computer run. As long as you let your computer run, it was still finding twin primes. Uh, but that's not a proof, that's just, compelling evidence. So people would love to be able to prove this. Okay, let's have some new definitions. So twin primes are primes that are two apart. We have some examples. How about we call it sibling primes if they're like four apart? Can you think of any sibling primes? Seven and 11, yeah, any more? 13 and 17, yeah, okay. So the conjecture would also be that there are infinitely many sibling primes. That would be a little bit easier to prove. Maybe you could prove that there are infinitely many sibling primes that would be four apart and two apart. Okay, um, how about if you call them like cousin primes if they're six apart? Can you think of any primes that are six apart? Five. 11 and 17, yeah, five and 11, yeah, good. Okay, so the conjecture would also be that there are infinitely many like co cousin primes, things that are six or less apart. Okay, suppose we kept going and eventually we event, uh, invented a number, a, a name like frenemy primes, primes that are 70,000 apart. Yeah, okay. So you could have this, this conjecture that there are infinitely many frenemy primes, primes that are at most 70,000 apart. That's what Tom John proved. So he was able to get some, um, uh, put some techniques, make up some techniques so he could prove that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that are at most 70,000 apart. And that was a big step because 70,000 is finite. We want to prove something about two. 70,000 is 
way closer to two than like infinity is. So that was a big step. And using his methods over the next couple of weeks, like three weeks after he posted he posted his paper, people were able to reduce this gap down to something like 350. So using his methods that he came up with. So it was a big deal. Um, and a really cool story. So never give up. Yeah. Okay, and I will show you um, again a picture or a short video of him that I wanted to show, but our projector is fine, so we'll resume with that thing after the break. Okay. So today we start a new topic, which is triple integrals. So over the last couple of days, we've been doing double integrals, integrating functions of two variables over areas. And now we'll start integrating functions variables over solids. That's the idea. So, but before we do, um, I thought we'd do one final double integral example that brings together all the techniques that we have. So, here's the idea. So, suppose you're supposed to compute compute, if you would, the integral from 0 to 1 of the integral of negative fifth root of x up to square root of x of s cosine of y cubed dy dx. Okay, this is your task. Okay, so let's just do it. What is the antiderivative of the cosine of y cubed with respect to y? Not possible. Okay, this one is not possible. We've talked about it. Uh-oh, I lost my microphone. How terrible. So, uh, we've talked about this, how um, cosine of some kind of polynomial, sine of some polynomial, has no antiderivative. So we can't do it. So the first thing, our only thing to do at this point is to change the order of integration. So let's change the order of integration and hope that in the other order we can solve it. So we want to write this in the other order. So here, let's see, here we had y on the inside, so y equals negative fifth root of x up to y equals root x, and x on the outside. So if we rewrite it, we get y on the outside and x on the inside of the same function cosine of y cubed dx dy. Okay, now we have to set up our limits of integration. So to do that, we need to sketch the region. So let's do it. So we need two curves. We need, I'll do this curve first because it's a bit easier. y equals square root of x. That's like a sideways parabola, yeah. So it looks something like this. And it goes through the point 1 comma 1. So this is y equals root x. And then on the bottom, we have y equals negative fifth root of x. So it's kind of like a parabola. It goes from 0, 0 to negative one, uh, 1, negative 1, but it's more square. So it looks something like that. So that's y equals negative fifth root of x. Okay, and this is telling us we want the x's from 0 to 1. So this was my x-axis, this is my y-axis, there's 1. And we want y's that go from negative fifth root of x, so down here, all the way up to square root of x. So we want this whole region here, like a sort of a backwards D-shaped region. Okay, so now let's write the, or write the integral in the other order. So we'll have to take horizontal cross sections. So, if, so let's see, for this one we'll pick our favorite y, so maybe our favorite y is here, and we figure out what the x's are. x goes from there to there. But there's two different curves. So we'll need to have two different integrals. So let me just, while we're at it, write up the second one. So we're going to have to go from y equals something to y equals something, x equals something to x equals something, cosine of y cubed dx dy. Oh yeah. We should, by the way, first of all, see if we have any hope of doing it in this direction. Is there an antiderivative of cosine of y cubed with respect to x? Yeah, because it's just a constant with respect to x. So it'll just be cosine of y cubed times x. Okay, so we have some hope of it working. Let's find our limits of integration. So for this bottom part, we're going to go from y equals negative 1. This is the point uh, 1, negative 1. We're going from y equals negative 1 to 0. 
And for the top one, we'll go from y equals 0 to 1. And now let's figure out our x limits of integration for each of these. Maybe the top one is simpler because it's y equals root x. So we go from x equals something on the left up to x equals something on the right. So on the right, we're just stopping at this line x equals 1. So it's 1 on the right. And then over here, we're on the curve y equals root x. We have to solve that for x. So to find some bounds, solve the curve equations for x. So we had uh, y equals root x. So y squared equals x. So this one should be y squared equals x, or x equals y squared. So the second one goes from y squared up to 1. OK? And now how about the uh, bottom one? So again, x is going to go from something to something. Again, x stops at 1 on the right. And now x starts on this other curve. So we'll have to solve uh, y equals negative fifth root of x for x. So I guess take the fifth power of each side. We get y to the fifth equals negative x. So negative y to the fifth equals x. So x starts here at negative y to the fifth. So here x goes from negative y to the fifth up to 1. Yeah? It's OK. Let's see. This is the moment of truth, whether it will work. OK, I'm going to erase our scratch work so that I can go directly down for these integrals. OK. So this is, I'll copy the outer integral, the integral from y equals negative 1 to y equals 0 of cosine of y cubed times x from x equals negative y to the fifth up to x equals 1 dy plus this one, y equals 0 to y equals 1 of cosine y cubed times x evaluated from x equals y squared up to x equals 1 dy. OK, let's just do it out. So this is the integral from y equals negative 1 to 0 of cosine y cubed times x when x equals 1. So that's just cosine of y cubed minus cosine of y cubed times x when x equals negative y to the fifth. So times y to the fifth, negative. So this becomes a plus. OK, so there's that first bit, dy, plus the integral from y equals 0 to 1 of cosine y cubed times x when x equals 1. So that's just cosine of y cubed minus cosine y cubed times x when x is y squared, so times y squared. And this whole thing, dy. Does it make sense? We just, so, okay, so we just, we integrated, which wasn't so hard because it was just a constant. So we just got constant times x, and then we plugged in the bounds for x. So we got this two pieces here and two pieces up here, which came from our, our x bounds. Yeah? And the, the way you found that um, y equals negative 1 value um, one? is because you intersected the line x equals 1 with the negative fifth root function, right? Yes, good point. So I found this point, 1 comma negative 1 by intersecting uh, y equals negative fifth root of x with x equals 1. So if you plug in 1 here for x, you get negative fifth root of 1, which is negative 1. Yeah. Yeah. OK. OK. So we have this thing that looks complicated. So much like the life of Yi Tang Zhang, which I am erasing, uh, we had fixed one hard thing, and we've gotten another hard thing. So we had some impossible integral. We did it one step, but now we've got something that kind of still looks hard. So let's see if we can overcome our obstacles again. OK, I'm going to write this in four pieces. So the first part is the integral from y equals negative 1 to 0 of cosine y cubed dy plus, again, the integral from negative 1 to 0 of cosine y cubed times y to the fifth dy plus the third part the integral from y equals 0 to y equals 1 of cosine y cubed dy minus 
the last part, the integral from y equals 0 to y equals 1 of uh, cosine y cubed times y squared on the outside dy. Okay, so to find the integral over that region, I'm going to have to do these four pieces. Okay, let's see what we can do. Okay, one thing you might notice is that the integrand is the same for these two. So we can combine these into a single integral because we're integrating cosine of y cubed from negative 1 to 0 and then from 0 to 1. So really, we're just integrating cosine of y cubed from negative 1 to 0 and then from 0 to 1. So it's from negative 1 to 1. Yeah? Isn't that going back to the same problem we had in the beginning? The reason we split the integrals is because we couldn't figure out what the cosine, what the integral of cosine y cubed with respect to y cubed. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, we, this brings us back to the same problem we originally had. So it seems like life is bad. So let's stop here and figure out what this is, though. Oh, 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 is this whole problem supposed to be sine? Yes. Oh, awesome. Okay. I was like, I'm not getting a, a symmetric, uh-oh. Uh it's supposed to come out to be an odd function on a symmetric interval, and it's not working. I don't know why. Maybe because I made everything cosine. So if it had, in fact, so everything works out the same. We haven't evaluated anything. So all good. OK, there we go. Good. OK, everything? Got everything? Yes. OK, so this is, I claim, an odd function with respect to y. Meaning that suppose you put in y to this function. So sine of y cubed is sine of y cubed. Now suppose you put negative y in here. Sine of negative y cubed is sine of negative y cubed. So I just, I just broke it up differently. I cubed my negative y. Uh-oh, this cube is supposed to be in here. And if you take sine of a negative something, it's negative sine of the something. So if you plug in negative y, you get the opposite of what you plug in when you of what you get when you plug in y. So this is an odd function. And we're integrating it over a symmetric interval. So whatever we get on the negative y side, it'll be equal and opposite to whatever we get on the positive y side. So it's a little bit strange to have y on the horizontal axis, but I'm going to draw it like that. So we go from negative 1 to 1. I don't know what sine of y cubed looks like, but who knows what it looks like. But whatever it looks like on the left, it looks equal and opposite on the right. So even though I can't integrate this and I have no idea what this number is, I know that it cancels out with this one. So this, um, and this is a symmetric, symmetric interval. I have no idea what these parts are, but I know that when we add them up, we get zero. So that's great. It worked out. We figured that out. So that, um, that takes care of parts one and three. OK, let's have a look here at part four. Can you find the antiderivative of sine of y cubed times y squared? You can, right? You're happy because the, it, the derivative of the inside is on the outside. Yes, so you can do a u substitution and get the thing. So let's figure out what this is. This is, let's see, it's basically cosine of y cubed. That's what the antiderivative is basically. Let's try it. If I took the integral, uh, derivative of cosine of y cubed, I would get negative, so let's put a positive here, uh, sine of y cubed times 3y squared. So I'm sort of off by a factor of 3. So let's put 1 third. So if I do 1 third cosine of y cubed, the derivative is negative sine of y cubed times y squared. So and we integrate this from, uh, we evaluate this from y equals 0 to y equals 1. And this is what? 1 third cos 1 minus 1 third cos 0. Ha! Huh. So that takes care of part 4. So all that's left to do is part two, this one. So we hope that we can do this one because 
otherwise, if we can do the other three parts, but we can't do this one, we still have nothing. So let's try to do this one. So this one, we can use integration by parts. So integration by parts says the integral of u dv is u times v minus the integral of v du. That's what it says. So um, the, the hard part of integration by parts is figuring out what should be your u and what should be your v. So we had some experience over here that we were able to integrate sine of y cubed when we had a y squared on the outside. So with that in mind, maybe we should make our v into something like, like that. So if we make our u into y cubed, that, and then we make our v into something we can integrate, uh, our dv, sorry, it's supposed to be dv, dv into negative one-third cosine of y cubed. Okay. No, that was wrong. That's v. Sorry. y squared sine of y cubed dy. Okay. So the idea is we start with this thing, sine of y cubed times y to the fifth dy. Okay. We want to integrate sine of y cubed times y to the fifth dy. That's what we want. So we take, we say, you know, I'm able to integrate things sine of y cubed times y squared. So I'm going to pull off two of these y's and put them in my dv and put the other three in my u. So now we have to figure out d, du, which is the derivative of this, so 3y squared dy. And then we have to sort of go backwards and take the antiderivative of this guy to get v. So this is something that I can take the antiderivative of. I have some experience with that. Uh, y, cu y cubed, y squared sine y cubed, that was one third cos y cubed. And now I need a negative because this one was positive. Okay. So it's coming up with which thing should be your u and which thing should be your dv is tough. Um, I hope that when you took math 25 or whatever your flavor of uh, Calculus 2 was, you spent a, lot, a bunch of time trying things that didn't work out and trying things that did work out. And today, with the benefit of having tried a bunch of things, this one does work out. So this tells us that the integral of uh, y to the fifth times sine of y cubed dy, okay, well, uh, uh, okay, I'll write this as y squared times y cubed times sine of y cubed dy. That's our original integral. And we've made this into uh, we've made this into our u and we've made this into our dv. It tells us that it's equal to u times v. So negative one-third y cubed times cosine of y cubed <sighs> minus the integral of v which is one-third so plus one-third cos y cubed du times 3y squared dy. Okay, so this is u times v. Uh, u times v minus v times du. Okay, so we should be able to do this. So now what we want to do is actually plug in, because, uh, okay, okay, I'll put it over here. Okay, so we have figured out what the antiderivative of this is. We've got it. It's right there. So the first part is one-third y cubed cosine of y cubed, and we want to evaluate that from negative one to zero, plus, can you find the antiderivative of this thing? we can. It's just um, kind of the same as before. So sine, uh, one-third sine of y cubed. So one-third sine of y cubed, also evaluated from negative one to one. So we've got all the parts. Now we just have to evaluate this one. This part was zero. We got that part. So let's evaluate this. So zero plus Okay, one-third 
Uh, when y is 0, this whole thing is 0. So we won't write that term. Uh, and then when y is negative 1, this is minus, 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 so minus 1 third uh, cosine of negative 1, plus 1 third sine of 1. Uh, this is supposed to be 0. Sine of 0 minus 1 third sine of 1. There are lots of little pieces here. But the broad strokes is that in order to do the part in the yellow, we had to use integration by parts, and we were able to figure it out. So let's see what we get here. So sine of 0 is 0. Uh, cosine of negative 1 and cosine of 1 are opposites, so those cancel out. So we get uh, negative 1 third sine of 1 minus 1 third cosine of 0, which is 1 third. So in the end, we get negative 1 third times sine of 1 minus 1. Okay, so there are a lot of parts there, but the purpose of doing this problem was to bring together all of our various techniques for, for doing stuff that's hard. So we started out with an integral that we weren't able to do, and we changed the order of integration. That's our first technique. Then we got two things that were equal and opposite. It was an odd function over a symmetric interval, so that part canceled out. That's another technique, like looking at symmetry. And then this one, we just, this one, we used a u substitution, essentially. We just took the integral. That's another thing we can do. And finally, for this last part, we used integration by parts. Question? Should be plus one. Plus one? Really? I took out a negative? This one should be plus? Sorry, this one should be plus? Oh, you're right. So, right. I factored out the negative sign, but I forgot to factor it out. Good point. Thank you. Yeah, other questions? Yeah, question? Isn't that, isn't that, <coughs> that one third sign of one supposed to be negative two? Because you subtract, like going back to the integral, like when you evaluate that. No, not, not the integral, but like when you evaluate the negative one to zero, right? you subtract it and then you. Just subtracting the sine of a negative, so the negatives cancel out. Like you do minus one third sine of negative one. So isn't that okay. Sure? So this should be sine of negative one. So it should be plus one third sine of one. Okay. And then I'll just make it like this. Okay. I, I'll go with that. Sounds good. Um, I think it's probably quite easy to make an algebra mistake. I guess I've already made two. So I wouldn't bet like my house on this answer being exactly right, but the method will work. And if I have made an, a, a negative sign error for that, I apologize, but it's going to be okay. Minus one, you can say. Minus one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, let's talk about triple integrals. So for, a tr for a, like a single variable calculus integral, you integrate over an interval dx. For a double integral, you integrate over a area region dA. And for triple integrals, you integrate over a solid region f of x, y, and z dV. So you can think of this dv as being like a little box, like a, a three-dimensional box. Um, so you can think of this function as associating to each point in space um, a number. So for example, it could be a, a temperature function associating to each point in this room a temperature. Or you, maybe you have a solid block of stuff, and it associates to each point of that material a density. Or maybe it's a, a charged thing. And it associates to each point a charge. In any, any of the cases, when you add it up, you get the total amount. Like to, uh, integrating density gives you total mass, um, and integrating charge gives you total charge. So that's the idea. So let's do an example. Um, so for example, so compute the triple integral over the region 0, 1, cross 0, 2, cross 0, 3, of the function 8, x, y, z, dv. 
So we don't have to sketch the region to do this. We could just plug and chug, but we might as well. So this says that x is between 0 and 1. So if this is x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis, x is between 0 and 1, y is between 0 and 2, and z is between 0 and 3. So in the x-y plane, we have like a 1 by 2 rectangle, and then we make it have a height of 3. So it's this box. There's our region. So if this gives us the temperature at every point, this room is essentially a box, uh, we could add it up, and when we get the integral, we would get the total temperature, which doesn't really have any meaning. But we could then divide, for instance, by the volume and get the average temperature in the room. And that would, be ha that would have meaning. So let's do it. So let's set this up. So we could do it in any order. We could do dx dy dz, dz dy dx, any order of x, y, and z. So there are six total possible orders. Any of them are OK. Let's do um, z on the inside, y on the middle, and x on the outside. So 8, x, y, z, and then dz, dy, dx. Gosh, there's so many integrals there. Slightly scary. If you are slightly scared, you can put blinders on so you just see one at a time. And with integrals, you always start at the middle and work out, like the opposite of a nesting doll. So let's do it. So let's copy the outer integral. X go from something to, oh, I haven't even set them up yet. OK, so my z should go from 0 to 3. My y should go from 0 to 2. And my x should go from 0 to 1. So if I copy those down, x goes from 0 to 1, y goes from 0 to 2. Let's integrate this. The integral of the derivative of 8xyz with respect to z is, I think, 4xyz squared. And we want to plug in from z equals 0 up to z equals 3. And that's the end of that. And then we'll integrate that dy dx. So let's do it. So again, we have from x equals 0 to x equals 1, from y equals 0 to y equals 1. Let's see what we get. When we plug in z equals 3, 3 squared is 9. 9 times 4 is 36. So we get 36 xy. And then we have integrate with respect to y, integrate with respect to x. OK, let's do it. Copy the outer integral. If you are a little bit scared, you can put on blinders to help you. So x goes from 0 to 1 of, OK, let's integrate this. Integral of 36xy with respect to y. I think it's 18xy squared. And then we're going from y equals 0 up to y equals 1 dx. y equals 2. Great idea. Y equals 2. OK, let's do it. We wouldn't want to go too small. OK, so copy the outer integral. OK, 18xy squared. When y is 2, this is 4. And 18 times 4 is 72. So 72x. And when y is 0, this thing is 0. Same thing over here, I forgot to say. But when z equals 0, the whole thing is 0. So we didn't write it down. dx. And let's compute this. The integral of 72x with respect to x is 36x squared. And now we plug in from x equals 0 to x equals 1 and get 36. OK. So if, if this 8xyz was giving the temperature in the room, you did the integral, you got 36 as a total temperature, which doesn't really make any sense. But if you divided it by the volume, you get the average temperature. Do you know the volume? Can you figure out the volume of this box? Yeah, 1 times 2 times 3, so 6. So the average temperature is 36 over 6, which is 6 degrees. So it's 6 degrees in the box. But maybe it's a little bit surprising, because it's, it's 0 degrees at the origin, but I think it's 48 degrees out here. So the fact that it averages out to 6 maybe is a little unexpected, so it's good we took the integral. Um, special cases of triple integrals, if you just integrate 1, the function 1, you get the volume. So that's very useful. Finding the volumes of, of strange shaped regions, you can use triple integrals to do it, just by integrating 1, in the same way that we were integrating 1 to find the area of regions before. Yeah. Yeah, questions or ideas? Yeah. Will it be an example of a, like, 
a shape where we can't find the volume using double integrals, but we can using triple integrals? Yeah, the, a shape where you can't find the volume using double integrals, but you can using triple integrals. Um, anybody have an idea? Oh, how about an ellipsoid? Oh, well, uh, It, once you once you once you once you um, do it once, you get a double integral. If you're integrating the function one, then you're just plugging in the bottom the top integrand minus the bottom integrand, so it always reduces to a double integral. Actually, so you could always find the volume as a double integral. Good point, but it might be nicer to set it up as a, a triple integral. And if you have a different density or whatever at each point, you have to use a triple integral to find the total mass or whatever. Yeah, good question. Okay, okay, let's do an example of a region that's not a box. Okay, so, example, um, compute the triple integral over r of x plus y dv over um, the solid um, under the surface z equals 4 minus x squared over the box where x goes from 0 to 1 or 2? Two. 2. Great. x goes from 0 to 2. Uh, and y goes from 0 to 1. Okay, so we should integrate this over this solid region. So let's draw it. So z-axis, x-axis, y-axis. Okay, we're go going over this rectangle where x goes from 0 to 2. So here's 2. And y goes from 0 to 1. So here's 1. And then there's our rectangle in the plane. There it is. Okay. And now... We have the surface z equals 4 minus x squared. So in the xz plane, which is this left sort of back plane, 4 minus x squared is just a downward facing parabola. So we start it at 4 here, and it's just z equals 4 minus x squared, just a downward parabola like that. And then it doesn't depend on y at all, so it's just the same for all the y values. So it looks like this same curve going down. see it? It's sort of like a, a, like a piece of a block of cheese. Like you had a wheel of cheese and you cut out this piece. It's not exactly a circle, but it's curved. Okay, so let's set up this integral. So let's set it up maybe in the order x equals, y equals, z equals. So you have x plus y, dz, dy, dx. Okay, so Here's the idea. You, I think of this as your shadow plane. So you take your region, which is a solid region, R. It's the whole solid, not just the outside. And you look at the shadow of R on the xy plane. And you want to set up these limits of integration like a double integral so that it integrates over this exact region. So in this case, it's not so hard um, because it's just a rectangle. So it's something we've set up a lot of times. So x goes from 0 to 2, and y goes from 0 to 1. And that gives us our shadow plane. This describes this region down here. Now for the z. Um, the way I like to think about this is that you're like threading um, a piece of thread through your solid in the, in this case, the z direction. So you start your piece of thread with your needle at negative infinity and you, you bring it up in the z direction. So you pick your favorite plot spot in the, in the shadow, so maybe this one, and start it at negative infinity and bring it up. And eventually your needle pierces through your cheese and it stays in for a while. And then eventually, oh, it pops out and now it's out. So you imagine it's like a thread going through your cheese and here and here, it's to here to here, it's inside. So we wanna figure out when does it come in and when does it come out? 
So it comes in down here at the bottom on the xy plane where z is 0. So we'll just set z equal to 0 at the bottom. And it comes out on this curved surface. So we'll have to solve this surface equation for z. But that's not so hard. It's actually already in that form. So it pops out when z equals 4 minus x squared. So we all go all the way up to 4 minus x squared. Yeah, question? Yeah. Maybe this is a stupid question, but when we plug those bounds in for Z, we're going to be getting a lot of X's, but we're going to be getting kind of Y. Is that totally fine? Yeah, so when we, end, when we integrate one step, we'll get 4 minus X squared times X plus Y, right? And that's just some polynomial in X and Y, and then we'll integrate it dy dx, just like before when we had double integrals. So if you integrate it dy, you sort of, you integrate the y, and then you treat x as a constant. So it's okay. Yeah. So we would just, uh, maybe we um, omit computing this one, if that's okay, um, because it will just be a polynomial and a bunch of algebra, um, and it comes out to something, 20 over 3. Um, let's try setting it up in, the, in another order of integration. So let's try setting it up where y is on the inside. So y goes from something to something, and then x. Z on the inside. OK. Z doesn't matter, but we'll do z on the inside, and then x on the outside. And then we're integrating x plus y, and then dy, dz, dx. Let's set it up in this direction. So now our shadow plane is the xz plane. So this is our shadow plane. So you can imagine that you have this block of cheese. You shine a bright light on it in the y direction, and you figure out all the places on the xz plane that are in shadow. Those are all the places that you're going to need to define your integral over. So let's draw it, the xz plane. Here it is. So I've kind of taken these axes and turned them around so that positive x points in this direction, as usual. We like positive x to be in the, going to the right. So let's define this. So all the shadow places, well, it's just inside this kind of uh, D-shaped region. So it's, it's, it's up. It's, it's this shape, just the same as this part. That's the shadow of the solid in the xz plane. So let's set this up. Now we're just setting up a double integral, which is something that we've done a few times before. So this order says we fix our x and figure out our bounds for z. So z goes from down here up to there. So z goes from something up to something. Down here, z is 0. And up here, z is on this curve. This, the equation of this curve is 4 minus x squared. z equals 4 minus x squared. So it's already solved for z. So z equals 4 minus x squared. And we want all of these vertical things from x equals 0 up to x equals whatever this is, and this is 2. So x equals 0 to 2. OK, so now we've set up our shadow plane. And now it's time to take our piece of thread and put it through our piece of cheese. OK, so we start with our favorite. Pick a favorite point in the xz plane. Maybe it's this one. So that's like approximately here. And take a thing in the positive y direction. So it starts at negative infinity for y. It's not in, it's not in, it's not in. And then it pierces, it comes into the shape. It stays in for a while. And then it pops out, and now it's out again. So we have to figure out at which y it came in and at which y it came out. Can you figure out what the y value is when this comes in? Yeah, it's just 0 to 1. Yeah, because our shape is kind of it's the same all the way through. Yeah. In this case, changing the order of integration didn't change the bounds. Uh, but usually it does. So this was a, a nice first example because actually they didn't change. We just permuted their order. But if we wrote um, x in terms of z. Yes. If you had gone in the, the third direction, if you had yz as your shadow plane, th things would have changed. So you have to have x in terms of z. Yeah, nice. OK. OK. So let's have one final challenge. 
which is, um, suppose that you add another piece of, OK, oh yeah, and so then we would compute this. So if this was like the, the density of your cheese, and it varies at different points because it's some kind of artisanal cheese, then you would get the total mass of the cheese when you computed this, which is 20 over 3. OK, so this should also hopefully come out to 20 over 3. Good, so now you know the mass of your cheese. So if you want to uh, carry a lot of it, you know how heavy duty of a thing you need to pick it up, which is very useful. OK, let's modify our region somewhat. So let's suppose that we glue to this piece of cheese um, a, a false bottom. So it, it um, on the, uh, down to the plane z equals negative y. So he, that looks something like this. So can you, you got the idea? It's sort of sloping off in that direction. So let's set up an integral to integrate the same function over this new region that involves this bottom slanty part. So now, with slanted base, and I didn't write the equation for it, but this plane in the back should be z equals negative y. So let's write this same first order of integration for now with the slanted base. So we want to go from x equals something up to x equals something, y equals something up to y equals something, z equals something up to z equals something of x plus y dz dy dx. So the first thing to do is look at our shadow plane. Our shadow plane is the xy plane. And our, our, our new solid, the solid with the white curvy part and the pink slanted part. We want to look at all the, all the solid. Now the shadow metaphor kind of breaks down, but you want to shadow from both directions, all the directions into the xy plane. Can you say which points in the xy plane you need? Yeah, it doesn't change. It's the same. We just drop the bottom down. So uh, we're still going from x equals 0 to 2 and y equals 0 to 1. That didn't change. OK, now let's pay, take our piece of thread and put it through. So again, we start, pick our favorite point in, in our region, our shadow region. Start at negative infinity. And it pierces in at some point. Now it's earlier because we have this new false bottom. And it stays in for a while. And then it pops out on the top. So it still pops out at the same place. z equals 4 minus x squared. But now it pops in at this bottom plane. So z equals something else. In this case, negative y. Because that was the equation of the plane. So it pops in at z equals negative y and pops out at 4 minus x squared. Yeah. So in this case, I think if we had changed the order of integration, if we had done this order of integration with y last, can you see that we would need two pieces? We would need one for when you pop in at the back, y equals 1, and y equals 0, and pop out at y equals 1. And then we need another one for you pop in on this slanted base and pop out again on this side, y equals 1. So things would change a little bit if we change the order of integration. Yeah. Questions or ideas? So cool, right? Triple integrals. So it's kind of fun. It's like you set up the thing. The big thing in triple integrals, the thing we'll be practicing over and over, is get a region and then write the order of integration in a different order. It's like a fun geometry problem and finding out where, where everything is. So, yeah. You can't do that algebraically to draw a picture? You have to draw a picture. You, you pretty much, you have to draw a picture. Like, algebraically, I'm not sure how you would figure out that, you, that your y comes in on z equals negative y and comes out. I mean, you can try to do it without drawing a picture. And you might get lucky. You will get lucky sometimes, and it'll work out. But the picture is really the way to go. Yeah, in this case you would know. 
that you that negative y is below 4 minus x squared. Sure. But if I asked you to write it in some other order, probably your life would be harder if you tried to do it without drawing a picture. Probably actually it's easiest to draw a picture to figure it out. Okay, thanks everyone.